Welcome to Walking with Spirit with Dr. Ruth Anderson on the International Angels Network and Enlightened World Network. I'm your host, Ruth Anderson, and I'm coming to you from Colorado. This show has been pre recorded, so we will not be taking any callers. Here at International Angels Network, we explore spirituality, angels, spirit guides, our loved ones on the other side, and much more. Our radio podcasts are available to you on Pocket Casts, Pinterest, Player FM, Podchaser, and now Overcast Radio. Listen to us on Alexa and Echo Amazon devices or download the TuneIn app. These are all easy sites to use and make it simple to listen to our archive shows. This episode of International Angels Network is sponsored by Holistic Light Rejuvenation Center. For more information, visit holisticrejuvenate.com. Sunday Sturgeon is the founder and CEO of Holistic Light Rejuvenation Center and is a host on our network. We're also pleased to announce that International Angels Network is also sponsored by Audible by Amazon. I would like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to listen in. This show is called Walking with Spirit. Walking with Spirit means consciously living in the physical realm with frequent connection to the divinity in the spirit realm and being open to all that they want me to experience. Every day, I check in with my guides, Divine Mother and God, sometimes seeking guidance, sometimes seeking connection and sometimes seeking their healing abilities. Many days I receive lessons by hearing, seeing, or feeling signs coming in from the energetic realm. I never know what my day is going to look like or what the next learning might be. I am an author and a spiritual counselor, providing individualized transformational experiences for my clients using Holy Fire Reiki, energy work, and connection with the spiritual divinity, including the Divine Mother, Archangels Michael, Gabrielle, and Raphael. Each week, I share a story about an experience I had while walking with spirit. As 2018 is drawing to a close, I spent a few minutes looking back at this year. One of the standout moments was sitting with my father as he transitioned from life in a body to life in the ethereal realm. I'm not usually one to look at the past, but sometimes it is helpful to sit back and take stock of how far we've come. In my daily walk with spirit over the past year, I joined International Angels Network and recorded over 50 episodes, spoke at two conferences, wrote two books, founded Enlightened World, created a website for it, and have 50-plus shows up on Enlightened World Network with the potential of hosting 1,100 shows before next October. Sometimes my head spins with all of the details, but time spent in meditation and prayer always brings me back into focus and alignment. In particular, I spent a great deal of time this year communicating with God and Archangel Michael. This year in review, I see that I have expanded far beyond whatever I thought was physically possible, embraced it, and truly walked with spirit. In so doing, I have seen that anything is possible. I know our time in these bodies is short. I am trying to make the most out of the time I have in order to leave a positive imprint on the world. I encourage you to walk with spirit in ways you didn't know you could. Who knows where we will be in a year or what we could possibly achieve. With that, I would like to tell you about our guest this evening, Dr. Michelle Petacolis. Dr. Michelle Petacolis is a national speaker and expert on the topics of loss, emotional wounding, and unresolved grief. She has a PhD in sociology and over 18 years experience coaching people through major life challenges. She produced the award-winning three-part documentary series, 
Secrets of Life and Death, and leads workshops and presentations for organizations throughout Northern California, including the Commonwealth Club of San Francisco, UCSF Medical Center, JFK University, and UC Berkeley. She has appeared on Voice America's Empowering Women, BBM Global Network's Courage to Overcome, Money, 1055's Rush Hour, and KPFA's Women's Magazine. She is a featured author in newly released and best-selling anthology, Breaking Barriers. So welcome, Michelle, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really impressed with the uh, coverage you have on all those different podcast platforms. Very impressive. Mm. Well, thank you. It's, you know, Claudia Ibarra is the producer and founder of, in, of International Angels Network, and she's unstoppable. She, she has turned over so many different um, avenues of promoting the shows. I completely give my, my hat off to her. She's, she's amazing. Wow. Well, really excellent. And very excited to talk to you this morning. I, I love the way in which you're talking and inviting people to uh, tap into their connection with divine. Well, so speaking of that, Michelle, as a light worker, you have carved the most interesting path for yourself. And you have dared to tread where many others would not. So can you tell us about your work. And then in a minute, I'm going to ask you how you got to that point. But first, could you share with us, what is it that you do? What I do is I empower leaders and change makers, which actually is all of us at a certain level, to overcome your fears and your emotional blocks so that you can step into your authentic power and live and die without regret. So that means I, you know, you, you were talking in the beginning about helping people or empowering people to connect with their spirit. Mm -hmm. I am so much in spirit. I am empowering people to navigate this three-dimensional plane by learning how to deal with their bodies and their minds because both the body and the mind has its own uh, they have their own agenda. And uh, sometimes we, we forget. Oftentimes we totally forget our body. You know, we kind of force it to do things, but it's a very, very powerful force. And then the mind, which is programmed uh, and a lot of stuff is inputted into it when we are children, also is a very powerful force. So that's where I come from. I come from this sense of this awareness of being a spiritual being, having to navigate this three-dimensional plane with, the, with these two forces that are my partners in this existence. You know, Michelle, I know that a, a bunch of your work has centered on people dealing with cancer and the grief of it and the realities of it. Um, you just said that bodies and minds have their own agendas. Do you, how does cancer fit into that, do you think? Well, my, the way in which I look at it or frame mm -hmm. it is that cancer has to do with our failure to pay attention to our body's needs. Mm -hmm. That our body all the time is is talking to us through the way in which we feel. The body has a, maybe a vocabulary of two, although with various nuances, pain and pleasure. And when it's unhappy, it will start sending us out messages that things are not okay. When you think about the way in which we are, are raised in this world, we are taught to shut down our bodies at a very, very early age. Mm -hmm. As soon as we go into school, as little children are put into these tiny little desks and taught to not pay attention to our body, to pay attention to the teacher and ignore the internal messages that we're getting, that, is, that sets us on a whole path of ignoring our body. And I ignored my body in some ways, I ignored it for years because I didn't want to feel my emotions. I understand that. 
And what, what prompted you to start paying attention? Well, part of it was getting into a spiritual group. This was after a number of, dis of life disasters or life challenges. First, losing my first job where I realized that my, my pattern of pleasing was not working. And I kept on downgrading myself and tamping myself down further and further because I didn't want to be rejected. And then my husband left me. And that was, that was kind of like the straw. And I decided, oh, I will join a spiritual community where career and relationships don't matter. That the only thing that matters is connection with the divine. Fortunately, the spiritual path was a path of the heart. And it opened me up to the awareness of my body and the awareness and connect, reconnection to spirit. I think it's fascinating that it took a connection to spirit to lead to connection to body. <laughs> I just think yes, it is interesting, isn't it? But that is that is the truth. In fact, when we, in my experience, when we connect with spirit and allow spirit to lead, everything else can fall into place. We can transform so much of the patterns and behaviors that we learned. Uh, in our effort to survive as children, we can change that much quicker when we connect to spirit. So just hearing you talk, I can tell you that I am 100% guilty of ignoring my body. And thank goodness it works well. You know, I, I don't have health issues, which I'm so appreciative of. But um, in my connection to spirit, well, you know, I think throughout my entire life, I have not been one to pay much attention to my body. So thank you for this conversation today. I will take it completely to heart and completely to mind and um, see what I can do about turning that around because I understand how important the whole body, mind, spirit piece is and they're all three equally important. Totally. Totally. And when you, uh, I have trained in psychosomatics. So one of the things that you learn is how the energy of source, the spirit goes through the body and the body is here for us to create in the three dimensional plane to fulfill our mission. We can't do it as spirit without the body and without the brain. Mm -hmm. And so when that body kind of gets distorted or tamped down or, or, or the, that uh, channel that goes from the top of our head through the, to the bottom of our feet, that channel that runs through us, it gets kinked from all the stuff that we go through as we grow up as children uh, that uh, prevents uh, the life force from flowing through. So we actually need to work on those areas of our, of our emotional uh, journey to, to unkink the hose, so to speak. So what do you, what is it that happens in childhood that causes, is it cultural? Is, what is it that causes us to just shut down that part of our bodies? Uh, we are, it's generational. It's been going on for a long time and it's certainly been influenced by, um, a, on a cultural level, this patriarchal culture that is really about shutting down the awareness of the body and um, uh, glorifying the brain. And I, my heart goes out to the men on the planet because they do struggle with these, you know, really demanding impulses, especially the sexual impulse mm -hmm. that, you know, women have, but not in the way that men do with it, with their, with their, the chemicals in their body. And so they feel the requirement of holding back, you know, this wild horse inside of them. And, and so the ability to hold that, to hold the emotions in, that's all the training that men go through is holding back their emotions. And, and when you think, when you go back ancestrally to the hunter uh, gatherer era of human development, men would have to go out and hunt, and they really did need to control their bodies in order to successfully hunt, right? They had to be quiet, they had to be focused, they couldn't allow a lot of emotions to get in the way. So they learned 
through centuries to tap that down. The thing is that we have both men and women because we need to be in balance, in harmony. And through women, men can learn to tap in also into their emotions and into that part of that awareness of their body. The thing is that we have been living in a culture, and I don't know where this is coming today. I usually don't talk about this, but here we go. That women, in their effort to gain more power in this particular culture, they have taken on the attributes of men. And so we we still have a long way towards creating that balance. We need to learn how to bring in that feminine side, that awareness, that emotional awareness uh, to our empowerment. Well, you know, it's interesting as you were speaking, I was given the visualization of the, the yin and the yang symbol. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the male symbolizing one and female symbolizing the other, but then it's also got that dot. That's right. Yes. <laughs> of the contrasting um, yes. force in there. And I was just thinking, yes, women have, you know, for, for some women, certainly because they are the leaders of their family. There's a lot of single families, yes. um, single parent families. And, um, but then at the same time, men, have also needed to, and that's my own verbiage, needed to embrace some of the feminine. They and do. So, yeah. So when we look at the yin and the yang, you know, the white's got the black dot and the black has the white dot. There's a need for each of us, I think, to hold on to that energy and that wisdom of the years of the other sex. Yes. But I wanted to kind of go down more on the personal level of, you know, what happens to us when we're mm-hmm. children. So you imagine that here is this amazing spirit that, that comes into the human body. But it comes into this body when it is extremely um, rudimentary, unformed, dependent, vulnerable, and dependent upon our parents to take care of us. And then, of course, our, our parents have had their Uh, emotional traumas in their childhood. And so there is a replication of certain patterns and beliefs. The parents, our parents want to make sure that we stay safe. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes in the process, they, they tamp us down, they squelch that life force energy that to a certain extent wants to take risks, wants to explore, wants to try things out. So it's finding that balance between what the body needs, which is to keep us alive, and what the spirit needs, which is to expand and explore and to manifest. I'm I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. How now you also spent several years working on death and dying. That's right. That's right, because when you go into that, that arena, it strips away all the facades, all the role playing, and takes people to the core of who they really are, or it can. I mean, a lot of people will fight all the way up to the end, but mm-hmm. that opportunity is there. Before my mother died, I had one of the the most powerful experience with my mother that healed a lot of difficulty between us and set me off on my path in that last in that moment two weeks before she died basically so what what was that for you what did that look like for you well what that was is that up until that point and i was almost I was almost 50 years old. That's a long time to be tamping down to mm-hmm. yourself. And yet I think that there are probably people who live their whole life that way. Of course. They never fully get out of, of being stuck. So I was stuck because I believed that I was not good enough. I was not valuable. The usual, <laughs> the usual yeah. fears that we all struggle with. And I can't say that my, my childhood was, was any more, um, Uh, difficult than anybody else's. In fact, of course, I've heard people have had way more difficult. But each of us have our story and each of us, it impacts us in a certain way. So mine was that I didn't bond with my mother. I bonded briefly with my father. He was transferred. The bond was broken. And so I learned this habit of pleasing people. And it worked really well. Boy, it works really well in school, doesn't it? Oh, sure. 
you learn how to please the teachers and you could get good grades. I got great grades. And then I got into the real world when I grew up and it didn't work anymore because the universe was asking me to step into my leadership. I didn't know anything about leadership. Leadership is you need to have self-confidence, belief in yourself. And I didn't have that. And so I kept on becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. I undersold my education, my skills, my intelligence, so that I wouldn't be rejected. Now, this thing about being rejected is really, really important. It's part of being a social being. And human beings are social beings. We actually survive through community. And so being rejected is a huge fear for the the animal for our bodies to be rejected, to not be held in love and respect. And you can actually see that a lot in politics and some of the people and they're struggling when they get rejected and what happens and how they deal with that. It's, ve it's very powerful and, it, and it's a driving force. And so that was what I was, it doesn't have to be that way. And there are some people that operate in a different way. They kind of reject that whole thing of being accepted and then they go into a different realm, more of performance. So if they amass lots of money, they will feel like they're, they're safe or protected, only it's never enough. I'm sorry, I'm really getting off the, the no, track. But... There's, no, it's a perfect track. You just keep going. Okay. So where, where, did, I, where did I start from? So anyway, uh, I tamped myself down. And uh, I mean, to the point where I was doing temp jobs. Because at least in a temp job, they needed me more than I needed them. And mm -hmm. if it ended, well, that was part of the deal. So I didn't have to feel rejected. I mean, that's really pathetic. I mean, I had a PhD. What was I doing in temp jobs? Mm -hmm. So I, my mother was dying of breast cancer. And I went back to help her finish up her life, so to speak. And my mother was a toy designer. And not a little just at your home, little workshop toy designer. She actually took her designs in partnership with my aunt to major toy companies in New York. Wow. Yeah. And there are, there are actually, and people remember some of the designs, some of the toys that those two made. And they are actually in some doll books. They didn't make a lot of money. And I didn't really give it much thought because I just felt neglected. I just felt like I didn't matter. I just felt like she was. So I, I kept her at, always at arm's length. However, in this last weeks, I, we were sitting in her studio going through papers. And I picked up uh, a paper. It was one of her designs, one of the ones that she really felt very powerfully about. And I handed it to her. And she looked at it. And she said, in this you know, just woeful sound voice. Mm. Oh, I guess I'll never get to that project. Mm. And it just, it just hit me in the heart mm. because in that moment, I really understood what deadline meant. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Only I was afraid. I was still afraid of my feelings, even though I they was starting to open it up. But then because they were opening up, they were overwhelming. I wasn't used to dealing with that, with those emotions. So I pulled back and I said, oh, we don't need to deal with this right now. And we never dealt with it. And that moment when I could have held a space for her to allow her to look at her regret and to look at her dying, I, I tamped down. I mm -hmm. shut down. And afterwards, I had huge regret. And oftentimes people will have regrets around the people that are dying. And it's a very powerful time when somebody is transitioning to the other plane. It's very, very powerful. And it just broke me apart. It, it broke me open. And I realized that I did not want to live with regret. Hmm. It empowered me. And I did, that's when I decided to make my film series. And that's when I decided that, that what was more important than, than feeling safe was not regretting my life. That's incredibly powerful. You, you spoke of fear of rejection. And for you, for a while, that kept you small. Mm -hmm. and, and I have seen 
many people, and I'm sure myself included, you know, it, well, <laughs> what day is it today? Um, you know, there's, I still deal with it in, you know, I, I'll take two steps forward and come crawling back three because it's, you know, it's scary to continue to put yourself out there. So I know for our listeners that they have had those same experiences. So thank you for, for embracing, you changed it from fear of rejection to not wanting to have regrets. It's like a, you know, you went 360 on that. So that's, that's really exciting. Can you tell us about the film series that you created? Because I know you have created several films and won many accolades for those. Yes, I created, it started out as one film. And I went out and interviewed everybody. It was really my journey towards healing and healing both the regrets that I had, but also healing a lot more than that. It, when we open to death, we understand so much more about life and the value of life. And that was my journey, listening to and interviewing people who were basically my teachers. And in the process, the film morphed into three films. Mm -hmm. And I had to go back in, in some cases and do some more interviewing. And I created uh, a three-part series, the first on facing death, the second on caregiving and the gifts of caregiving, which was called um, Caring for Dying, the Art of Being Present, mm -hmm. which is interesting because it's a double meaning. It's being present not only to the other person, but being present to yourself. Because if you don't, if you're not present to yourself and you just throw yourself away on this other person, you can't really stay present because right. you have to take care of your body and you have to take care of your emotions. And then the last one was called The Heart of Grieving. And that is about that journey uh, into loss and coming out the other side. And they're all stunning. I mean, and I can, you can see them on your secrets of life and death.com. You can see the trailers uh -huh. I, I, uh, and uh, you can also purchase them uh, on the website. Uh, don't try and purchase them at the university level. There is a home use uh, level that you can buy them at. That's much more reasonable. Um, but uh, they are used in universities and colleges all over the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia to, to help people who are working in psychology, sociology, anthropology, nursing to, to be more aware. I had one hospice call me and say that the films were the best she had ever seen at allowing people to understand what that experience is to go through dying. Just the trailers are touching. Thank you. Yeah, just stunningly touching. I'm rarely did trailers bring tears, but mm -hmm. your the people that you spoke with were so genuine and so in the moment. It it's profound, really. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the idea th behind those films was to open up the conversation, was, which was to enable people who were seeing the film, generally in a group, to have the courage to speak their own truth. And you can imagine when I started this film, which was actually shortly after my parents died, mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of conversation about death back then. And that was part of my irritation was that, oh, why didn't I know this was so important? Well, nobody was talking about it. People still don't want to talk about it. It's better, though. You know, and I think it's specific to the person involved, too. I think there's some folks that are really open to it and would love the opportunity to speak about it as they're facing it themselves. And I think, you know, others are still quite closed off, but well, believe me, it, it, I have a lot of compassion for people who have a difficult time doing this because right now my husband and I are going through talking about setting up, uh, uh, what is it called, a, a revocable the trust. trust. Uh -huh. 
And we've gone through some real hard emotional stuff, just even beginning the conversation. It's very tricky to start imagining your death and what will happen when you die and what will happen when the other person dies if they die first. Mm -hmm. It's very triggering. And I believe that 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 this body, which is wired, is programmed to keep us alive, does not like to think about those things. It's just like, oh my God, it's very triggering. Yes, my husband and I have gone through the same, through the same process. Um, and then walking my parents through it as well. Yes, my, yes, my father passed in February. Oh my and gosh, just this, just this past year. Yes, yes. Uh, and the last, um, we knew for a year that he had mesothelioma and mm. it gave us the opportunity to heal. It, nice. it was a difficult first 87 years. <laughs> I hate to say that, but, but even my father would agree that his last year was his best. Wow. And it was somehow knowing he was dying gave him the freedom to become a more loving person. And he, he truly healed every relationship he had. Wow. It was quite a gift. So that's what I'm talking about. That, that death period is so powerful and it does take us out of our roles and it puts us in touch with what is really important and can reconnect us to spirit in a way that we forget. Right. Right. And I'm, I'm so thankful that my sister and I stayed with him through it because um, other family members weren't willing to let go of the hurt of the previous however many years and didn't come to the table. And as a result, my sister and I have had so much healing and are in such a better place mm -hmm. than the ones that chose to stay hurt and distant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, my heart goes out to those people who are too hurt to move forward at that time. Right. Because the pain and the fear, it's very, it's very palpable. It's very forceful. Again, reminding everyone out there that's listening to this, that though that our bodies and our minds are powerful forces and it takes practice to control them, to bring them in line, to master them. It takes practice. Well, and, and sometimes you just have to slap yourself into doing, <laughs> into doing it. You, when you said that, I thought of my sister and I at my father's deathbed and if I could have been anywhere else in the world, I would have preferred to, but I had to be there and I knew I had to be there. And Ruth, my guess is that there was a lot of practice on your part long before that happened that made you able to be open to that moment, to that time. I suppose I would have to think about that for a few minutes, but yeah, well, I was with my, my best friend when she passed away. I, I know that was a big learning ground for me, right. but, I, but I also didn't want to have any regrets. Yes, that regret. Said, and I knew that my being there for him and with him was a huge piece of my not having regrets later. Yes, yes, yes. When I was going through the, the deaths of my parents, I had no knowledge or understanding of regret until that moment that I had that talk with my mother. And it took a while to land too, you know, it didn't happen instantaneously, but it did, it landed. It just blew me apart. So in your work with other people that are dying, do you find that where they are in their ability to accept or not accept what's happening to them, does that, do you find that their involvement with a spiritual being, with a God or source, does that really make a difference for people at the end? My advice for anybody who is accompanying somebody who is dying is to be with them where they are. Mm 
-hmm. not to try and push them to fulfill your idea about how death should happen. As you allow that person to open to whatever is there for them, they will be able to have the growth that they need. But when you force somebody or push somebody and you, you will push up against resistance if it's not right for them. them and, no. Yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you please finish. The people are where they are in that moment. And, and so to give them the permission to be whoever they are in that moment and that to be okay, that is such a huge gift. Yeah, that reminds me, my father was a research scientist, I think every minute of his life, actually. And um, on his deathbed, my father was lucid, as lucid as he had ever been. And he was sharing with me that which he was experiencing passing. Oh. And, and he was experiencing it as a research scientist. He was as fascinated with, with every moment as it rolled out, as he had been with his atmospheric research all of his life. It was so cool to be able to see that he was in, in his transition so um, perfectly him. Yes. And curious, which yeah. is something that we all can apply in our journey, especially that final journey of being curious. We always have the choice between being fearful, which is not really a choice we would want to make because when we're in a state of fear, the body, it, it tightens up it resists, it freaks. And so I, in, in the classes and workshops that I've given around preparing for dying or dying well, I always encourage you to become curious. What's this next thing? What is this next experience? What, wow. So I was accompanying a, an, uh, a man who had lost his wife and was dying a, well, he had a bum heart. He had had a bum heart for years. He had a pacemaker and he always thought he was going to die first and his wife beat him to it with cancer. Mm. So he, in that last year, it was an exploration and he remained curious till the end. It was one day I had come and he was really moving slowly. In fact, he took forever to answer the door and I thought I had to, was supposed to call 911. Mm -hmm. And he, he was a mathematician. So you can imagine the mindset of a mathematician. And he was sitting and we weren't talking for a while. And he, I was sitting on the couch and he was sitting on the chair. And he suddenly, he said, you know, the thing about slowing down is that you see things around you that you never noticed before. Mm. He said like that vase with those beautiful bright red flowers and that kimono on the on the end of the couch the color contrast between the turquoise and the and the oatmeal color of the couch mm. oh my gosh it gave me goosebumps because mm -hmm. he, he was right most of his life was spent in his mind and suddenly in slowing down in doing having this different experience he was looking at the world in a whole new way with new eyes and he was curious. That's, that's really beautiful. And I'm, I'm remembering my father during his last couple of weeks. He still spoke about his research, uh, truly, until the day before he died. But he was, in, in your words, slowing down. And he was bringing in his past life experiences, including ones that he hadn't remembered for wow. a long time. And he was putting the pieces of it together in, in sort of his life in retrospect, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is very important for somebody who is dying. It's called the life review. Mm -hmm. It, it help, allows the person who's dying to get a sense of completion about their whole life. It's, it, it's helpful to the body getting used to the fact that it's going to transition. So I interrupted you, please go on about these, the, your father. Well, no, it just, um, 
it reminded me of this gentleman you were speaking of because, you know, my father too was in his brain all the time with his research, but here he was stepping out of that place of comfort and looking at life a different way. And um, like I said, putting those pieces together and, and looking at the spiritual aspects as well. My father was religious, but went, sang in the church choir every week, twice a week for over 50 years. And it just was a way of life, I think almost more than a religion <laughs> for him. Um, but my father was always spiritual. And, mm. But he didn't talk about it at least not to me, because all he ever talked to me about was his research. Um, so what a gift to be hearing about his life in the perspective of a spiritual being, when that wasn't at all what I had seen over the years. Um, but that end of life sifting through what you've been through, um, both in a body and as a spiritual being, and coming to that that closure, that round circle. I mean, he was telling me stories about him as a child, as a spiritual being, which was really very cool and fascinating. Wow. Wow. So, so the, the, the lesson for me in this and the message that I share out to the world is don't wait until you're dying to have this awakening because there isn't a whole lot you can do at that point. Don't wait until somebody in your life dies or leaves you before you wake up, that you can actually start to take steps now to, to invite in that spiritual part of yourself, that brilliance, so that that becomes your guiding light instead of what people told you was how you should be. Yes. Yep, that full circle of embracing you in all of your you in all of exactly. your uniqueness. <laughs> yes. Hmm. How different? Well, and I, I don't know that we need to go there, but how different would your father's life have been had he been allowed himself to share more of that spiritual side of himself, not only in his work but with his family? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Well, and the other life lesson that I learned from this, both both from being with my father, his last year, and you know certainly at the end, and my my dearest friend when she was ill and passing of cancer, and what I saw with both of them, I think that the people in our lives, it's kind of like an onion, and the person who's ill is the centerpiece, and the people around them you know, as you get closer into the middle of the onion, those are the people that are the closest to you. And with both of them, I saw as their illness progressed, they lost, you know, the, the acquaintances and, and some of the friends and some of the family members. And so at the very end, at the deathbed, there were like two people because it's, as you get to that moment closer to death, there are fewer and fewer people that can do that with you. Right. And I, I want to clarify what you mean by can do that with you mm -hmm. are maybe meant to do that with you. Yes. Yes. Right. You know, and that the people who aren't meant to do that uh, drop away. Mm -hmm. And the people who are meant to be there are there not just for the person who is dying, but for their own journey. Yes. Beautifully put. Thank you. It, it is tricky, though, stepping up to that plate and, and really being there for someone at that time. And I know that that's, you do grief counseling. You work with individuals. Is that the kind of thing that you work with people on? I started with that because that... I worked in hospice for a while and I was leading uh, partner law support groups. It has evolved and I'm working still with people who are going through transitions, but it's any kind of loss. And I'm working with people who are stuck and want to move forward. There are, there are many 
avenues for people who have lost somebody who they love and they're not necessarily going to work with me you know unless they they are you know some very high powered uh leader executive who needs to get their life back on their path quickly there are many many venues out there so i mostly work with people who who have gone through uh, a challenge a life challenge and need assistance in getting back on track in all those cases what i find is at the core at the root of the issues are these early childhood wounds and programming that hold us back. And the thing about the life challenges are that they become a gateway, uh, an impetus for change. Most of us do not change. We are willing to accept mediocre <laughs> or okay because sure. it's a lot feels a lot safer and it's known to doing something really out of the ordinary unless we are compelled unless we are pushed it's just the nature of human beings and and uh this human body is that there it kind of has to be pushed well the nature of nature uh the biggest changes that happen evolutionarily only happen when there's a crisis that's true that's true. That is when people grow. That's when people grow. I invite people to become more aware and maybe start to make the, take those steps even earlier than that. Do you really want to wait until somebody dear dies in order to wake up? Do you really want to waste any of this precious life waiting? So that's where I come from, is if you have an impulse, if you feel stuck, if you uh, have a gift that is lying fallow that you want to bring out to the world, don't wait. So what does, what, what does your work look like? Would somebody call you? Can they work with you over the phone or do they need to be with you in person? How does that work? So people work with me. I have a, a number of programs so people can work at whatever level they're ready to work with me. Uh, a lot of the coaching is over the phone. I have some, in, in some of my programs, I have what's called a deep dive. And those are three hour sessions. And those are either in person if you're local or they're over Zoom. Mm -hmm. So I can see the person, we can see each other. But then there's also group, and I love group work, uh, working with other people on the phone, uh, bringing those people together, and it's always synchronistic. Whatever one person is talking about always resonates with the other people. It's, I, I just trust spirit on that, and it always works out that way. It's just, um, it's very goosebumpy how that works. <laughs> That's a great verb. I like that. Um, so is the best way for people to learn what you do to go to secretsoflifeanddeath.com? Is that the best avenue? I would say if they wanted to learn about me, yes, they could go to secretsoflifeanddeath.com. It has not been, uh, what is it called, um, updated in some of the places. The best place to look at are my events page and the the media page which has interviews and talks and the blog which has got my latest uh, the latest work that i'm doing okay and speaking of life challenges michelle what where are you heading what are what are your next um ideas and things that you want to take on I am moving into a realm of empowering women with my work. I believe that that is the missing piece to transforming the planet, to getting it back in its um, in balance. So a lot of women have grown up like I have, learning to tamp themselves down, to be of service, to be pleasing. And I am motivated, I am, my purpose is to provide them with a, um, 
venue in which they can start to transform that programming, to learn to um, master their bodies when they get afraid, how to deal with that, and to master their mind states so that they can step into their true power. And the more women who are out there being empowered, that's the way in which we're going to change the world. And what's cool is you don't have to choose something that you don't want to do. In fact, that's not what you want to do. You want to choose to do that which you're meant to be here doing. And a good sign of that is that it makes you just feel wonderful when you're doing it. Do you help women figure out what that might be? I do. Okay. I do. Yes. In fact, I have a, a great new um, guided meditation that does exactly that. And how, do, how would they find that? Uh, well, uh, they can go to... Um, well, they could email me right now. I haven't gotten it up yet for, uh -huh. for the general people. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what the website will be. It's probably going to be re, uh, release your brilliance or something like that. But I, it, are you going to be putting any kind of information up with this, uh, with this yes. recording? Yes. So I will make sure that that's there for them so that they can get a hold of that if uh, that is something that interests them, is this recording that helps them to step into their, to, to identify w what their heart is telling them. So it's a practice. And you might have to listen to it a number of times because because our bodies, when we're used to listening out in the world and a, and attuned to listening outside of ourselves, listening inside of ourselves takes practice. Yes, it does. Yes, it absolutely does. So, um, Michelle, we've got about three minutes. Is there anything else you would like folks to know? That's a very good question. Thank you for that. I would like them to know that they are here for a reason. I guess there's a, a quote or statement about um, there are two important days in your life, the day that you were born and the day that you understand why. Mm -hmm. And I invite people, I invite women and men to open up to the possibility that there is a reason for them to be here and to become curious about what that is. And if they need help, I'm there. That's what I do is help people. I, am, I have an amazing, that's my gift. Oh, I know what else I want to say mm -hmm. is sometimes the trauma and the difficulties that we go through as children provide us with the tools and skills and the direction that we need to go. So there is no, oh, poor me. Every one of us, our story is also our journey of empowerment. I appreciate that. And as, as difficult as that is for, for some folks to accept, I, I believe that in my heart to be true. So I just to finish my, because I kind of got off on, on there, just to finish in my case, my gift is to be able to really hear other people and help them to get inside to hear their hearts. That is my gift. And just in speaking with you in, in person the other day and here with you today, I truly believe that to be true. Um, I, I would encourage any listeners that if you want to know anything about um, grief and the dying process and Dr. Petticolis, please check out secretsoflifeanddeath.com. She truly is a gem, an amazing um, resource for all of us. So um, Michelle, that's all the time that we've got tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Ruth, for being an awesome interviewer and host. Oh, thank you. So um, thank you all for listening in. It is always a pleasure to have you all with us. It's truly an honor to be among the hosts of International Angels Network and Enlightened World Network. 
If you are listening in on International Angels Network, we're excited to have a show called Living Shamanically with Garrett Jackson. It shows once a month on Mondays. Please join us on Tuesdays at 9 o'clock Eastern Time for Diane Morgan with Angel Navigation. Wednesday's show is called Angel Talk with Sue with host Sue Broom. Saturdays, we have Susie Parrott out of London. Please check out these other shows. And I look forward to walking with spirit and you next week. Good night and God bless.